All right, this is the Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show, and today I'm pleased to have Juan Javier Cardenas, star of the FX TV show Snowfall. How you doing today, Juan? I'm doing great, Eric. Good to see you, man. So what does the line, I'm a soldier, not a drug dealer, say about where Alejandro's heart is at when he's talking to Carter Hudson's character, CIA operative, Teddy McDonald. So that line comes from a scene of when Alejandro uh, is trying to lay out exactly the plan that he needs um, Teddy McDonald's help in. This is exactly what I need. My soldiers are now, they're stuck in a jungle. The Sandinista, the Sandinista forces are literally day by day inching, inching closer into finding out the camp that we are stuck in. Okay, so his his troops' backs are literally against a wall, you know, so they're, the, the stakes are incredibly, incredibly high. However, the Contras have this opportunity through their connections, through different friendly governments in Central and in South America, and through connections in the LA area with certain narco traffickers that are existing in the area at the time. They have the opportunity to get control of this very, very, very precious product, which is cocaine, which at the time is billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. So they have the opportunity there. However, Alejandro is a soldier. The world of sliding in to the cartel world, sliding into the cocaine, narco trafficking world is something that's different from him. He needs to be working with people that can provide him protection, a structure, to, to give him a way to organize, to organize it so that none of the paper trail comes back to him because if the Contras are found out to be working in tandem with narco traffickers in the United States, the, the Contra war will lose all PR credibility all PR credibility and certain officials, people like Alejandro could, fa could fall, you know, under prosecution of the DEA and the FBI. These are people that are looking very intently on what's going on in Los Angeles. So when he says that to Teddy, he's like, listen, you know, I've got the product, but I'm not a distributor. This is outside of my world. You can help me with that. So what that line I think highlights is the necessity of these two people that can provide different skills, that can provide different things that the other people can use, but that they need each other. And what's really fun about the show is watching these two characters that are very radically different, come from different backgrounds. They have the same goals in mind, but seeing them stumble and kind of fall and kind of figure out a way to make this relationship work between them. Do they bond? Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna be so cliche. You're gonna have to watch the show. They have more chances to really, to really connect. But of course, of course, where they connect is uh, politically. This is 1983. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Teddy, Teddy is a CIA officer working for the Reagan administration that, of course, was politically aligned with the goals of the Contra fighters. So what Alejandro does is that he appeals to, uh, I think, Teddy's uh, nationalism and understanding. You know, where where his government sides. That really, they're they're comrades in arms. They've been separated separated you know they've been separated uh because of politics because because of the denial of the funds down to the contras but we're on the same side here and what that's a tactic i think that alejandro can use and, and does use to really implore teddy into saying that listen you know i need you but you know that what i'm trying to do you agree with you know that what i'm trying to do is right in your eyes we're on the same side of history and if you just join in me you'll be completing a promise that you know your government broke to my people you know so why don't you right the wrongs with me let's let we can do this together you know for the good of of the country and the good for both of our countries how would you frame the relationship between alejandro ustavez and the cia operative teddy mcdonald uh, it's a symbiotic relationship. They both need each other for what they want to accomplish, right? But they have different opinions about what's the best way to go about accomplishing the goals that they both agree on. They're both things that they want to do. But part of, I think, you know, the, the drama and the stakes of the show are you have two very radically different people that have really specific, hardline opinions on what is the best way to achieve their goal about funding the Contra War, right? So a part of, I think, what's going to be really interesting and what's really going to be exciting for the audience is to see these two people but heads find their way around problems find ways to kind of live with each other they're kind of like a dysfunctional odd couple a little yeah. bit which is like you get yeah. a little bit of you get a little bit of humor in that yeah. seeing these people kind of stumble along and trying to figure out exactly what's the best way to work with each other and so I think that I think I think that's a very relatable thing that I think people that are watching the show are gonna take a lot from Juan Javier Cardenas now how much of, of Juan is actually in the character of Alejandro. There's small, slight connections. I'm nowhere near <laughs> the reality of the uh, uh, inherent uh, violence and the extremism of the character that I play. I'm a very normal, <laughs> I'm a very nice guy. Absolutely no. However, 
However, there are there are certain things that I I think that are that are small connections that I that I did understand and I could I could appeal to you know there's there's a cliched uh, way of speaking that actors kind of talk about playing characters that might not be the most or morally upstanding people and they usually say that they're like well I can't judge my character I can't judge my character's actions people say that a lot but there's a, there's truth in it the reason why is because if you if you put a blanket kind of judgment on your character's actions you're immediately kind of separating yourself kind of psychologically mm-hmm. from from the role mm-hmm. right and all that means is that when you're when you're on the set and you're in the middle of a scene and you're trying to interpret the material and you're saying the lines and you're saying the words that these characters are saying if you if you already have that kind of like one little wall because you're thinking like wow how different am i from this person right now that he could be saying these things and doing these things and that's not me that's not me you're already kind of psychologically putting yourself out of the moment you know you have to find the kind of connective tissue you know between you and the character to at least try to understand the point of view that the character is coming from because then you'll you'll know the where you know you'll have the wherewithal to be able to portray the decisions that these characters made so i i say this i say this a little bit that you know this uh, this character he's from nicaragua that suffered you know a huge you know revolution you know that 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 threw the country you know the other way around and uh, was really like a country that was torn apart families were torn apart i mean the the, the civil war in nicaragua is one of the most brutal violent Violent civil wars and political revolutions that happened in, in Central America, you know, that, that we remember in our recent history, okay? Mm-hmm. So not with, and with all due respect to the revolution in Nicaragua, my, my family, we do come from slightly troubled countries. My father came from Cuba. My father is an exile mm-hmm. of the Cuban revolution. And with absolute respect to the Cuban American community and the Cuban community and the Nicaraguan American community and the Nicaraguan community, those revolutions, they're not the same revolution. They're unique in certain respects, but there is there is connection to it. Mm-hmm. There is similarities to it. So what I mean by that is that on a certain level, I could understand working on a character like Alejandro because I can relate to my observations of people in my family longing for a country that for them no longer exists, having the having the world kind of taken out from underneath their feet and being kind of lost in that, that exile experience of feeling that, oh, I, I lost my way of life. And wow, I would do anything. I would do anything to be able to piece the life that I remember back together. And now, of course, like I said at the beginning, I don't know anybody that goes to the extent and to the lengths that my character does, you know. But in his, but the thing to remember about Alejandro is that in his mind, he's a he's a patriot. He's not an extremist. He's not a terrorist. You know, he's he's going farther than anyone else is willing to go for the good of what he believes is the good for his own country. You know, so that when you work with people and when you when you listen to people and you know about people like that, those people are true believers. You know, and once they cross that line of certain action, they tend to not even see the line behind them that goes that far. This is a, a this can has the potential to be a very unpredictable, a very dangerous character that's complete and full of passion because of how much he's lost. When when you've lost everything, you know you're willing to do anything. Mm-hmm. Of course, how many people are have lived that kind of experience? You know, some have, some haven't. But I think. I think a lot of people, people in the audience, people watching in television have been in moments where they feel like unjustly like something was taken from them mm-hmm. and they feel like their lives were turned inside out by some kind of, some event that happened in their life, you know? So with that, I think if we can find one way for them to at least entertain the idea of understanding where Alejandro's coming to, I think people will be surprised and, you know, surprised by, you know, how much they can relate to the character no matter what he does. Do you think Alejandro is Machiavellian? Absolutely. There were people, there were, there were contra fighters, contra generals, because here's also the thing to, to realize is that, you know, that wasn't that long ago, you know, the, the, the Sandinista revolution is not that long ago in our present history. So there are, there are people that are still alive that went through that, you know, which we, which we have to respect and which I personally respect a hundred a hundred percent, you know, because hopefully they, they take from this character, something interesting, something that gives them, you know, a different perspective on it. But uh, the last thing I want to do is to be flippant about it. Right. Mm-hmm. But to that point of what you brought up, there were there were contra generals that have that have been uh, interviewed in the years since, and something in an oft repeated adage that they say is that listen, the ends justify the means, and that is completely Machiavellian. So I think that's a very astute observation. In what fashion do you see the FX 
TV series Snowfall benefiting the viewer? I, re- I really love the show. So I think it, it can benefit people in, in so many different ways. So I'm just going to spitball and do a bunch of stuff, okay? I think it benefits the uh, particularly particularly the, the people from Southern California, the people from California that, were, that lived through the era of the 80s, that can remember glimpses of what happened when crack cocaine came you know came came as an epidemic through the city of los angeles and how it affected the bay area northern california and southern california and it gives i think an opportunity for communities that were affected by that whole era it gives them a bit of a voice it gives it humanizes the people that went through that so that they don't become just statistics we have a tendency I, i've said this before and i think it's true and i include myself in doing this you know when we read statistics on a page about you know the drug epidemic or an opioid crisis and things like that a lot of those are numbers you know so what narrative fiction like film or television or theater can do is that it humanizes the you know the people that went through this kind of thing it tells their story that's on a very basic level that's really great but also what is better snowfall benefit it, it was able to it's able to tell those stories in an amazing entertaining incredibly cinematic way and what i think that i i want to i want to always remind people when i talk about the show is that the amount of talent and creativity that's behind it on the creative side of the producing side you know this is a vehicle this is created by you know john singleton spearheaded by dave and on the showrunner there is such a push in this first season to really push the limits of as far as like cinematography in the look of the show on television that responses that we've gotten have been so warm and so excited about the look of the show and how it's kind of pushing the envelope visually and and adding a little bit to the visual language of television which i think is fantastic will we see a love interest for alejandro i i i I have to be cliche and say you gotta you gotta watch the show i can't i cannot divulge you have to I want I want people watching this interview to be like ah okay well I guess we gotta I guess we gotta watch the next episode because I can't I can't give you a hook so what was it like to work with film director John Singleton John Singleton is a is a director that of course must be said he's one of the premier writer and director creators um, in American cinema of course in the last 50 years Um, I've known about John Singleton's work for a very long time I've love film obviously so i've seen of course all of john singleton's films boys in the hood higher learning boy baby boy um poetic justice really. and um so when you come into a, when you come into a project where you understand that you're working with somebody who's been on the vanguard of american cinema you know and that and that's not me exaggerating you know this is somebody that carved a very specific artistic you know narrative niche for himself you know by himself and it's, it's incredible there there was a not a tendency, but I thought about, I wondered the day that I would meet him and be able to work with him on a project. How would that be? You know, what, what his personality would be like. And I really feel that I don't usually do this, but I feel like I can speak for, I think so many people on set and the actors that he came and his presence on, on set was that he was a member of this company of actors, a member of this crew, a member of this project. And he came with, with no airs no airs of a kind of elitism he came and he spoke to people i can only speak for my you know my uh my experience with him um and the people that i knew working in the scene with me with him um he loves this material so much it means something so personal uh for him you know because it reflects part of his history reflects part of the community that he grew up in it's such a love he's in love with these characters and it not just and not just with the characters that are based in south central he gave the same from my experience he gave the same amount of attention to the storyline that takes place in south central to my storyline that takes mostly place in the valley and in parts of hollywood as he did with the east low storyline and the respect that he gave to the material and the respect that he gave to the actors was fantastic that's what you want that's those are the experiences that you want to have those are the experiences that you always you always hope that you have when you get a good opportunity wow this opportunity is fantastic i enjoy the material i enjoy the character i hope that the people that i'm working with are good people i hope that i can that i can build like a relationship with them on set that is a good working relationship and that's what it was now what would your dream role be ah ah man that's very yeah that's uh let's think it'd be it's it's tough you know why because it's it's such a cheap answer but i wish i could go back in time and work on certain great films <laughs> that i that that i love so much i i wish i wish that i was in the 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 hemisphere of scorsese when he made mean streets i wish that um I was in, in Japan, you know, during the season 7 I could have done a Kurosawa film. It'd be great to do Iago and Othello. 
A good answer is that hopefully the role that I that I really feel towards the end of my life, ah, you know, I'm so glad that I was able to get a chance. Hopefully it hasn't been written yet and hopefully down the road I'll fall into that opportunity and it'll be something new and not something I'll try to fish from the back. You're also a musician. What attracted you as a youngster to the two-tone ska movement of the late 70s? I'm of the age that I kind of grew up and you know my high school years were in the late 90s and what was going on at the time was that big kind of third wave ska boom right and so previous to that I had listened to I'd always listened to a lot of different kinds of music right I had Latin music from my mother's side um, salsa music um, cumbia music Cuban music uh, from my father my father grew up listening to kind of his way to rebel is that he grew up to like listen to like uh, you know American and British rock and roll you know so I listened to the stones through my father and things like that when I got to getting a little bit older, of course, there was first kind of the, dr the grunge scene and things like that. So I'd get, you know, I'd hear about, you know, earlier than that, Guns N' Roses from my cousin, you know, and then through my sister, through all the grunge bands that were going on. And then eventually you stumble onto like punk rock, which a lot of people listen to punk rock, right? So I started listening to punk rock. And then by a one point in the, you know, late, mid to late 90s, you had the third wave ska revival happened that third wave that came up here hello Next where we are down. yeah here we are in southern california they you know that big spearhead right the big explosion that happened and in that time the the ska scene uh, the ska bands, you know, they were very, they were a bit removed, you know, they were a bit removed from the two-tone era and stuff like that, and they were very closely linked to the kind of the punk scene, you know, not just in, like, bands that would play with each other, but of course just musically, musically, you know, it was, it was a whole genre of punk, Universal ska, styles. absolutely, you know, they had they had as much in common with the specials that they did with, like, you know, hardcore from yeah. the 80s, you know, so that was the kind of, the, that was the kind of the way in, you know, so at, what would happen is that, I think it's really super common is that kids that would listen to these kind of, like, seminal bands, you know, that came out in the third wave you would listen to their record and that because of what I enjoyed listening to and I guess I suppose kind of like where my wavelength was I would gravitate more into kind of more of the two-tone kind of songs and I would gravitate to more of the songs that were a bit slower and they didn't go into like you know hardcore breakdown breaks and then what would happen is that you turn the CD over and you would realize oh okay this is a selector cover oh there's actually a cover of the beat mm -hmm. oh there's a cover of the specials and then you go well who's well i like that kind of music that, that's kind of where i'm more gravitating to and then what happens and you buy the record of the specials right and then you love the specials and i listened to the specials for years and then you would start listening oh i really love the song monkey man you know or oh, i really love uh, guns of never own or uh, you know gangsters and then you look up and you're like oh that's a prince buster song yeah. oh that's a toots of the maytel song and then you just kind of go back and back and back and back and what i like about you know whatever you want to call it like if you want to call it the, the american ska revival scene or reggae revival scene and things like that there's that common thread where all these bands are kind of reinterpreting old material and that when you're a young kid it's really exciting because you get to go back in kind of time and you get to find all these like little these kernels of where this music came from and it's exciting to yeah. you you know what i mean so that's kind of that's how i kind of fell into it and it became a big part of my life you know it, it became such a big part of my life that eventually when I went to college I played in bands before and I played in all kinds of bands like you know like punk you know punk bands garage bands I played in a, in a you know band in high school that was more you know more experimental um, you know free bass kind of jam band because I played jazz for a long time so I, I was, I'm very all over the map you know I can listen to like a yes record you know along with a Toots and the Maytals record and have a great time you know but when I got to college when I got to college and when I really wanted to to play music I really wanted to start up like a ska revival band so I started a band in college with some friends called the Duppies that are still work that are they're still in Florida and they're an awesome band really really good live band but the interesting thing about it was is that when I started it my goals for that band oh I want to do a very traditional Jamaican ska, early blue beat, rock steady band. And then what actually, what happened was is that the, the convergence of all the influences and us being kind of young, like American kids going to college at that time, so many more influence came into it and i think what when i listen back to some of our early material and even stuff that they that they do now you see it's a much wider net and it and i feel like a lot of our early stuff yeah it was maybe more two-tone influence with like you know the tempo and everything like that a quick highlight the duppies and you did an album called throw one punch yeah i did i did one album with them and
and some of the material that I, uh, that I wrote with some of the members made it onto their next that our next album. The Duppies are a fantastic band. They regionally play down in the southeast. Uh, they've toured and played with a lot of really great established New York City ska bands. Um, they've played with Lester Ska Sterling from the uh, from the Scottalites, California's Chris Murray. Uh, they're a great, great, great backup band for visiting artists down into Florida, and they still tour and they do really awesome stuff down there. So that was the Duppies. That's why I played with them for about four years. Played on one record, and they still release albums, and they're awesome. Great big live band. Really high. It's really high energy. Really high energy ska, and they play some rock stay and some reggae. So then I went to New York. So I went to the New York, which of course, for the, a lot of the music that I eventually got into, which was a lot of American bands that were reinventing like old Jamaican material, kind of going back to the kind of old authentic Jamaican sounds. For me, New York is really where the epicenter of all that happened. So when I, when I got to New York, I started playing music with a lot of people that were involved in the early kind of late 80s, mid 90s ska revival scene that came out of New York. So when I, by the time that I went there, a lot of these guys in this older generation, people from bands like the Slackers, earlier bands like Mephiscopheles, Scofflaws, the De Factos, a lot of these people were still in the city and they were still gigging, but there wasn't like a, there wasn't a scene that was happening. That had kind of happened before. So while I was in New York for about, for about four years, I found myself falling into a scene that had kind of like a, a, a match had been lit uh, around like the borough of Brooklyn and places like Williamsburg and Bushwick that all these small little indie venues had been popping out and out of that grew a scene, a real scene of musicians called, we, we all called it the Brooklyn Rocksteady scene and it was like this next generation of musicians that were playing music that was much more influenced by older Jamaican reggae, like uh, late 60s, early 70s reggae, Toots of the Maytals, uh, Lee Scratch Perry and the Upsetter style reggae, a lot of organ driven instrumental stuff um, and so out of that came fantastic bands. I was in a band called The Hard Time that included ex-members of Mephiscopheles, um, the De Factos, and then half of it was New Generation Kids. We released an EP. We got to play, I don't know how many great, you know, illegal loft parties, you know, parties in Bushwick. That was a great band. Uh, I was able to guest uh, help out a band called The Fourth Rights on bass for a while. The Fourth Rights were a fantastic band. That, that band has now you know has changed and members from that band are now playing in this fantastic band called the far east that i suggest everybody listen to the far east band from new york they're a fantastic band that i don't know if they would agree with my assessment of, of the music but i always think that they kind of play they play like uh lovers rock late 70s early 80s reggae mixed with like sade so That's if you dig cool. that kind of stuff yeah. with like a real 80s veneer okay yeah. And, and get this full circle. So these are young kids, mostly, you know, they're all American kids that grew up in these kind of like ska, reggae revival scenes and stuff like that that were spearheaded by bands back in, you know, the UK, which were British bands interpreting old Jamaican material. And this band in particular, the Far East, now they've toured like three times with the specials. Also, I have to give a big up, one last, one another band. There's a lot of great bands in New York, uh, but another great band that you should definitely check out uh, their music is a band called The Frighteners. And they're a fantastic band and they've released music with Dip low on his mad decent label also with the fantastic 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 uh trendsetting label daptone records mm -hmm. which of course is charles bradley's label and of course lily sharon jones and the frighteners have released uh, fantastic music and I th th while we were there everybody was in awe of the frighteners because they had such a command on old analog vinyl sounding old school reggae alton ellis rock steady style reggae and they're fantastic and they were course led by the vocals of the late singer uh little dan klein who's unfortunately passed away but they have an incredible record on daptone so you should check them out did you fall in love at all during your time in the bands i i well i did i did i fell in love with my with my wife that i that i'm that i'm married with her now that we have a wonderful family and she's seen me man she has gone to like some really far-flung places to see me play music she's gone to like bars you know way in some far-flung borough of new york you know catching a train with me and then coming all the way back at three o'clock in the morning and she's always been a an awesome support you know how do you weigh how do you take care of your wife and your career and do you, and you have kids yeah, i have a family wow yeah, how yeah. many kids do you have i have uh, i have one i have one uh, child right now and we have another on the way having children is like the biggest responsibility in the world yeah. how do you juggle both of those? by having the right partner and um i i, I say this a lot I, I talk about with friends i i talk about with friends that that are that are married and that they're that they aren't married you know um like i said everybody's life is different what i can only speak to is my experience right and 
and I mean this in, in really full sincerity, I think that the person that you eventually find as the person that you're that you're that you're with for the you know rest of your life, when you find that when you find that love, when you find the person that you're meant to be married, that person becomes the second half of a team, of a cohesive team, a unit that it becomes y you guys against the world. And the best partners are the ones that they're there for you no matter what, that they fill in, you know, your inadequacies, what I'm missing, what I'm missing, she fills, vice versa, you know? I, I have felt, and I, really, and I really do mean this, that when you find the right people, those are the people that really push your art forward they give you they give you a reason they give you inspiration they give you a reason for 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 attacking your career they give you a reason for attacking um, your art in a way to push it further and further and further because you're you know you're doing it not just for them you're doing it for yourself you're doing it for the team you know and that's what that's what a good family unit is and that's what I try to do I try to be the best best husband that I can and I, I try to be the best team player that I can but I know that that person's it sounds so cheesy. That person's ride or die. You have to ride or die with your with with your family, and uh, I've been very 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 blessed. Highlights yeah. of you acting in Law and Order SVU. Law and Order SVU. I'm a big Law and Order SVU fan. So of course every actor in New York that's like a stage actor becomes a rite of passage. You got to do a Law and Order SVU. So I had a great. I got to work with uh, all the the fantastic people. Hello, Mariska Hargitay. Um, uh, Ice T, <laughs> Richard Belzer, um, uh, Lieutenant Stabler. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> like uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it was fantastic. Also, let me say about that. My experience on the show is that they had that crew has been doing that show for so long. It's such a well-oiled machine, and they have people that come in do guest stars and do co-stars all the time. You know, it's I mean it's an endless line of people. Mm -hmm. When I walked on, everybody from the director down to the DP, everybody treated you with great respect said hey we're so happy that you're here you're a part of it that's really great even if it was for one episode so i i, I really look at that fondly it was my first television uh first work that I ever did in television the good wife the good wife was fantastic the good wife i the good wife i didn't speak any english <laughs> i did a the it was an entire scene that i was entirely in spanish uh my wife jokes with me uh sometimes she'll say she'll go yeah i don't think anybody you know um outside of the industry knows how your voice really sounds like because in most of the things that I do, mostly I'm doing with like accent work or something like that. But The Good Wife was great. The Good Wife was a smaller role, a uh, smaller role at the time. But the same thing. It was a great. It was a great show. Great show. Um, uh, everybody was incredibly cordial. Everybody was incredibly cordial. I feel like the a lot of the TV that was shot in New York when when I was able to do it there, everybody was very happy to be there because it's a smaller industry in New York. So I think people were really excited about doing TV in New York. So I've always I, I met like a lot of good attitudes. You know. Scandal. You were on Scandal. Scandal is there's not there's not a, a huge story to Scandal. I, I did very small small little roles on on Scandal and stuff like that. I will say this though because I remember the feeling that I got when I walked on the Scandal set that there was when I when I did these small little you know these little guest stars on it. I remember walking on set and it was right at the height the height of Scandal first you know those first couple of seasons and I remember feeling on set that they're like oh this is a big show this is a big show people you know every how people were walking around and you know da, 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 da. sometimes you get that ambiance there are some television programs that have been on for a while and they're more relaxed and things like that scandal is one of those shows that i felt that there was this ambiance in the room like oh we're kind of this is kind of a big thing you know so that was cool ncis la yeah that was great i got to work with ll cool j that was fantastic he is huge he is yeah. huge <laughs> yeah. man he is this incredible physical specimen of a man but incredibly nice Incredibly, incredibly nice, incredibly warm. I don't know if you've gotten a chance to speak to him. No, not yet. Okay. He's an incredibly warm guy. I think maybe possibly what it could be is that he comes from another art form. He came from music and then he transitioned into acting. So he has no airs of, um, uh, I guess, what could you say, kind of like a, an austerity or anything like that? No. When I met him on, when I met him on set and we had a couple of uh, things together, incredibly warm guy, very helpful guy. And uh, that was awesome. Your voiceover work on the video game Red Dead Redemption, which was a very popular video yeah. game and very educational. That's right. And I always feel I always feel like uh, ashamed because I'm not a big video game player. My brother plays video played video games for years. And I always feel bad because I, I I've met people who have loved Red Dead Redemption, loved it so much, and I don't I, I have not really played the game. However, I can speak to the voice recording for it, and it was a great session and. 
it's been said a lot of people have been talking about the vo industry in uh, in video gaming and the amount that technology c continues to get better and it's incredible so i really did have that wonderful experience where i got to go to a studio in new york and i placed the head place the head inside the multi-camera you know kind of cubby where they photograph your face from all these different angles and they make an amalgamation of your existing face with the character design i mean it's it's pretty amazing if you were to if you watch the game if you watch the game you watch my character in it i do not look like a uh you know a 50 year old balding uh man that's uh selling <laughs> women into prostitution uh, with l missing teeth but you can you can tell the bone structure is there. You can tell that there's a bit of my face in it. It's, it's amazing. And it was super a lot of fun. Do you believe that you are the measure of all moral truths? No. How do you feel about the future of the world? I have trepidation about it. But I believe, uh, I was just talking to my wife, I think there's an, an inherent nobility on people. Because with all this trepidation about the, about the future, we get up every day and we put a strong face and we walk out and we get out of bed. So that's how I see it. What is your mission statement? Be kind and be creative. What advice would you give to somebody contemplating suicide? Hold on. Talk to family. Go through the proper channels and speak and just take a moment. How would you define the word love? Intangible. If you believed there was a hell, would Hitler be rotting there? <laughs> yeah, I think he would make it. Yeah, I think he would make that. Yeah. What brings you the most peace in your life? My family. What would you like your legacy to be? That I've passed on good morals to my children and that I'm a good memory to my wife and that I'm a good memory to my extended family. Watch Snowfall. Wednesdays at 10 p.m. on FX Snowfall. Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show with Juan Javier Cardenas. It's been great having you on the Blaring Out with Eric Blair Show. Signing off. <laughs>